Thank you for watching Scary Animal Attacks. If you like this episode, please remember to hit the like button and leave a comment or two. Then subscribe and click on the bell to receive notifications whenever we release new episodes. Welcome back to Scary Animal Attacks. Today's episode takes us to a very unique location in time, geography, and culture. In the Indian state of Uttarakhand, the south-flowing watershed of the Alaknanda River carries water from the Himalaya Mountains into the Ganges River and out to the Bay of Bengal. The upper stretches of this river starts in some of the most rigorous and challenging terrain on the planet. The mountain soared to over 20,000 feet in elevation, with Nandi Devi reaching nearly 26,000 feet high. The terrain here drops from the highest peaks to around 2,500 feet in about 90 miles in distance. This is an average drop of 256 vertical feet for every mile traveled. The deep ravines and valleys host one of the most diverse arrays of plants on the planet. Pine trees dominate the higher elevations and give way to more tropical trees as the elevation decreases. Here the climate ranges from tropical in lower elevations to glacial near the mountain peaks. Both climates influence the area in between at various times of year. This area has been cultivated for thousands of years and in places is terraced to create flat areas for farming and ranching. The patches of wilderness and forest between the agrarian areas are still hosts to wildlife, both beautiful and dangerous. In the mountains, the rivers Mandakini and Alaknanda meet and form the headwaters of the Ganges River. This area is fraught with danger, but the danger doesn't stop with the cliffs or rivers. The animals of this area are fierce and powerful. Tiger, bear, and leopard attacks in this area are rare, but do occur, and are named after the location they terrorize with their predation on humans. Tigers will frequently become predators of humans due to loss of health and potency in catching their normal prey. Leopards, however, differ because they will scavenge food when they need to survive. Some Hindus create their dead and pour the ashes into the Ganges River so that the remains travel to the sea. In times of famine or pestilence, these ceremonial rites are modified to include the dumping of dead bodies off of cliffs after ritual cleansing by a burning coal being placed in the mouth of the dead. In the event that environmental stressors combine with a famine or disease in the human populations, lepers will have many human corpses to scavenge from at the bottom of the cliffs. After the disease or famine resolves itself, the leopards may be deprived of a previously reliable and familiar food source. Given their familiarity with human meat, it is easy to see how hunting humans is second nature to desperate leopards. In 1918, the world was gripped in the throes of the global pandemic of influenza, and no part of India was spared this sorrow. One million people reportedly died from the flu, providing an abundance of human remains to any struggling leopard. On June 9th of 1918, near the village of Bainji, the man-eating leopard of Rudapriyag began its killing spree. It struck again shortly thereafter with another human kill from this area, and the 50,000 residents of the 500-square-mile area of the district of Garwal were placed under curfew. They were ordered to stay inside from sunup to sundown in order to avoid being killed by the leopard. In the daytime, business people sold goods, shepherds herded their sheep and goats, and people carried on in the typical fashion. But as soon as the evening approached, a frenetic energy encompassed the villagers. Women hurried their children home, while business people quickly carried their wares inside to safety. The people were afraid, and their behaviors showed it. As light faded, a hush fell over the land as people were on alert for any unusual noises or concerning developments near them. Some of them installed additional doors in their houses for alternative avenues of escape if they were attacked while they slept. On one of the local farms, a 14-year-old orphan was taken in by a farmer and was assigned the responsibilities of tending the goat herds. The boy was of the untouchable class, whose members were treated the worst in the caste system of the time, so he was made to sleep with the goats in the barn. He cordoned off a corner of the barn for himself to keep from being trampled by the goats as he slept. The farmer would shut the boy and the goat herd inside the barn each night and securely lock the door from the outside, and the boy would roll a large rock to support the door from the inside as well. The barn only had one door and no windows, and the farmer slept upstairs in the comfort and safety of his house. With the boy in the barn, 40 goats were packed in each night. On a particularly dangerous night, the man-eating leopard crept up and somehow managed to pry open the barn door, scattering the goats into the night. It quickly crossed the barn and broke the boy's neck. It carried his body down a steep embankment over a terraced field and into a boulder-strewn ravine. 
The farmer searched for the boy and his goats the next morning and found the boy's remains. He also recovered his goats, none of which had so much as a scratch. A few days later, two friends sat inside the L-shaped room of a home owned by one of them, with the door closed but not locked. In the darkness, the men chatted and passed the pipe back and forth, enjoying a smoke as they talked. The owner of the building took a puff from the hookah, then reached to pass it over to his friend, who dropped it onto the carpet, scattering burning tobacco across the rug. As the owner bent over to pick up the pipe and tobacco embers, he chastised his friend for being careless. As he stooped over to scrape up the embers in the pipe, light shone into the room from the now wide-open door. In the doorframe, and backlit by the night sky, was the profile of a leopard, and in its jaws it carried the body of the man's friend. While he explained the occurrence to other people, the building owner reported hearing no noise, no moans from his friend, no padding paws across the floor, no dragging limbs striking the floor as his friend was carried away. As soon as the leopard left the doorframe, the building owner waited for a minute, then quickly secured the door and retreated inside in fear. A short distance away and a few nights later, a village leader's wife fell sick with fever. Two of her friends had decided to take care of her and nurse her back to health. The sick woman and her husband lived in a home with an inner room with no window and a single door, which led to an outer room. This night the room to the inner door was left wide open to the outer room. In the outer room, there was a single door which led outside, which was locked, and a tall, narrow window, which was about four feet off the ground. In that window was a large brass vessel, in which water was stored for the sick woman's caretakers, to use to provide water for her to drink. This vessel took up a substantial part of the space of the window, with only a few inches open on each side of it. The sick woman's two female friends decided to sleep on either side of her, on a blanket in the inner room, to watch after her. The sick woman's husband slept on the bed just outside the inner room and positioned a dimly lit oil lamp near his bed to show light into the inner room for the women to move around if they needed to. After the members of the household and their guests were fast asleep, the leopard somehow crept through the narrow space in the window without knocking over the brass water vessel. It padded silently around the husband sleeping in the bed and stepped over the sick woman's friend to bite her by the neck. It broke her neck and carried her body from between the women without waking either of them. As it pulled the sick woman's body through the window, it knocked the brass water vessel out of the window, raising a clatter, which woke everyone in the house up. As the husband cranked up the oil lamp, the sick woman's friends quickly walked into the outer room to see what the racket was from. The body of the sick woman was crumpled below the window and had four distinct large punctures in her neck from the leopard's teeth piercing her flesh. The leopard was never seen by any of the occupants of the house. Sometime later, a 12-year-old girl had accompanied her father and her uncle while they moved their buffalo herd to a new grazing location. The group was new to the area and had not heard of the leopard attacks plaguing the citizens of Rudapayag. Their herd was very protective of them, and they weren't afraid of much due to this tendency of buffalo. They picked a vacant food plot that was previously cultivated but was left barren this year to encourage shepherds to browse their animals there to increase the fertility of the plot. The men drove large stakes into the ground and tethered their buffalo in a single line down the length of the narrow plot and set up their own beds a short distance away on a narrow and flat piece of ground that connected the plot and the road. As the people slept, they were awakened by the buffalo snorting and clanging their bells in alarm. The men lit their lanterns and walked amongst the buffalo to see if they had pulled their stakes loose and quieted them, leaving the girl blissfully sleeping in her bed. The men finished up and returned to their beds where they noticed the girl was missing. On her bedroll were pools of blood. In the morning, the men followed the blood trail around the tethered buffalo and across the food plot. It led down a steep embankment, where the leopard consumed most of the girl's body only a short distance from the men. This girl was the man's only heir, as he had no other children. The reports of the attacks of the man-eating leopard were relayed to Jim Corbett within a few days. He was in the area, staying in a bungalow, and after waking, had stepped out onto the veranda into the fresh morning air. After stepping off the veranda, he glanced down and saw the tracks of a large leopard just a few yards from the bungalow. It was distinct and very fresh. He followed it toward the gate near the road and continued as it led across the road to a trail left by sheep who'd passed by the previous night. The leopard's tracks were very clear in the freshly disturbed dirt and led to the left from the gate. Corbett knew how to tell a lot of information from animal tracks and could tell this was an older male, probably far past his prime, but large. It was a mere few minutes ahead of him, so he followed the tracks for a mile down the trail before it left and entered dense brush. 
Just down the road was a flat plot of ground left barren for future cultivation. A shepherd had led his herd of sheep there that had passed by that previous night. He kept the herd there and fenced them in with a thorn fence to keep them from wandering and being eaten by predators. As Corbett approached, the shepherd was opening the thorn fence to allow his sheep to graze. He indicated that he had not seen a leopard. Corbett asked the shepherd to allow him to purchase one of the sheep to use as bait. The shepherd told Corbett that he was wasting his time, as a leopard was not an animal, but an evil spirit that took the form of a leopard to kill people. The shepherd relayed a story to Corbett that he had heard from his father. Before the shepherd was born, the land was plagued with a man-eating leopard. Hunters tried to find and kill the leopard, but all efforts were fruitless, as the leopard seemed to always slip away. Villagers of the area were told to follow a curfew that would ensure they were not out after dark and came out only after sunup. The villagers had a meeting to discuss the cause of the attacks. The grandfather of the latest victim spoke. His grandson was taken from bed next to the grandfather the prior night while they slept. The grandfather told the other villagers that the victims were massacred by a flesh-eating villager, not a leopard. The other villagers laughed and claimed he was grief-stricken and was searching for an explanation for his missing grandson. The grandfather persisted and blamed it on an overweight holy man who lived in a hut near the temple. He convinced the village men to watch the holy man and see if he was out of his hut during the next attack. He pointed out that the man slept all day and only emerged at night and that he arrived just before the killings had started. He was fatter than everyone else, despite not farming any land nor having herds from which to feed. They formed themselves into three equal groups and placed the man's hut under surveillance day and night. The killings were happening at regular intervals, so the next attack was expected to occur soon. As expected, the holy man slept all day while the villagers watched him. Toward evening time, the village men saw the holy man depart his hut and he stayed out for the entire night. Upon returning, he was seen to have blood all over his face and hands. He entered his hut and began to sleep. As he slept, the villagers went to their homes and brought back grass to pile up around his hut. By daylight, there was nothing left of his hut but ashes, and the killings ceased that day. After relaying the story to Corbett, the shepherd refused to sell the sheep to him. Instead, he offered that Corbett would borrow the sheep, and if it died, he would pay for the animal. If it didn't die, Corbett would give the sheep back to the herder, and that would be that. The shepherd gave Corbett about 30 hours to complete this hunt with his sheep as bait. Corbett immediately tied the sheep along the path the leopard was using to enter the village. The sheep was immediately killed by the leopard, but was not eaten. The leopard clearly preferred to hunt human beings for food. Reports of the leopard's behavior forced the government to issue gun licenses so that more villagers had firearms to kill the leopard. They also offered a bounty of several thousand rupees to soldiers on leave to kill the marauding man-eater. The villagers began using drop-door traps baited with goats and sheep in an attempt to catch it alive. Two British soldiers became convinced they were going to catch or kill the man-eater. They believed the cat would cross the Alaknanda River using one of the suspension bridges. They staked out one of the bridges with, with one on each end of the bridge. The soldiers waited for two months while constantly observing the bridge before their patience paid off. The leopard was noticed after it walked onto the bridge directly under one of the soldiers, posted up on the tower to the bridge entrance. The soldier near the leopard fired his rifle, and as the leopard ran across the footbridge, the soldier on the other side emptied his revolver in the cat's direction as it fled toward him. The soldiers were certain they had hit the leopard in the back and the head. They examined the bridge and found blood from the cat. They followed the leopard for several days, but lost its track in the jungle. For the next six months, there were no attacks on people. Villagers and various interested parties continued to look for the wounded or dead leopard, but found nothing. After discussing the events with the soldiers, Corbett was convinced they had wounded the leopard in the left rear paw with the rifle bullet grazing the rear of the large portion of the pad. He also believed the soldier firing the pistol had missed every shot he had taken. Over the next few months, villagers trapped 20 leopards in the drop-door traps and killed them. One of the leopards terrified the villagers so much that they decided they didn't want to kill it, fearing that its spirit would become even more invigorated to torment them. The villagers sent for a Christian Indian to come perform an exorcism on the leopard, but it dug its way out of the cage through the dirt floor and escaped before it could be completed. At one point, the leopard had killed a man and was feeding on his body. After eating, it would rest nearby before returning to consume more of its kill. The leopard was seen departing the man's corpse and was followed. It was seen entering a cave in a boulder field. Men placed thorn bushes over the entrance to the cave and pushed boulders closing up the cave with the leopard inside. 
Once word got out, people began to gather to marvel at the trapped leopard. One of the influential leaders of the area didn't believe there was a leopard in the cave and bent over and removed some of the thorn bushes from the mouth of the cave. As soon as the thorn bushes were removed, the leopard sprang from the cave and sprinted right through the crowd of 500 onlookers and disappeared into the brush. After hearing of the strange and incredible exploits of the leopard, Corbett was reluctant to join the hunt for it. He was uncertain how he would be welcomed by the locals. A local authority by the name of Ibbotson was a friend of Corbett's and wrote him a letter recruiting him to help kill the leopard, a request Corbett could not deny. Corbett arrived in the Rudapriag area and immediately began reconnoitering the territory. He estimated the area spread over 500 square miles of difficult and inhospitable land. He noticed that the Alaknanda River divided the leopard's human hunting ground into two unequal sides. The river was fast and didn't lend itself to being crossed by any animal. There were canyons and cliffs all along the river, and no easy way to get across at all. Uphill from the river on each side, the farmers had terraced the hillside to farm on flat ground. These terraces were rimmed with steep embankments crowded with brush, and between the terraces were stretches of jungle that could host nearly any animal secretly. Corbett mused himself at the difference between man-eating tigers and man-eating leopards. Tigers would be more successful at killing people in the jungle, and mostly hunted during the daytime while people were active as well. Tigers have a pretty good sense of smell as well. Leopards, on the other hand, hunt at night, and given people are not as active at night, are emboldened enough to walk right into town to hunt people. They also have a poor sense of smell, but amazing night vision, which helped them stalk the darkness of night. This would make hunting the leopard much more difficult than a tiger. Corbett also looked at the known behavior of the leopard, noting that this cat had carried its victims as far as four miles from where it had killed them before eating them. This leopard would often do this with no one pursuing it. Corbett considered a normal leopard easier to hunt than tigers. Hunters didn't have to mind the wind currents due to their lack of a good sense of smell. They can also be killed by many methods, like poisons and traps, due to this as they will not pick up human scent as easily as a tiger does. Villagers would commonly use homemade pressure-sensitive bombs placed inside the carcasses of animals. Once the leopard bit into the bomb, it would detonate, frequently blowing the leopard's head off or shattering its jaws, leading to a painful, prolonged death. Leopards are also easier to track, as they prefer to use paths to navigate the forest, and certain jungle animals will give the leopard locations away by alerting each other to their presence. They also rest during the daytime and enjoy sunning themselves on rocks which makes them easily observed and photographed for hours on end. Corbett completely underestimated how difficult this man-eating leopard would be to kill. One day, 20 pilgrims had arrived at a shop a few miles away from a shelter down the road. They were exhausted and begged the shop owner into letting them sleep on the platform in front of the building for the night before continuing on their pilgrimage. He refused for fear the leopard may attack and eat them, and that would be bad for business. A holy man came along and told the shop owner that he would sleep in the middle of the group of pilgrims, and if the leopard attacked, he would rip the cat limb from limb himself. The shop owner reluctantly agreed after the claim from the holy man. Ten of the female pilgrims slept inside the building behind the locked door, while the ten men and the holy man slept on the platform, outside with the holy man sleeping right in the middle of the group. In the morning, the holy man was missing from the platform. His blanket was wadded up on the edge of it and was spotted with blood. The shop owner and male pilgrims followed the blood trail down a hill and across three terraced fields to a low stone boundary wall. On the wall was the corpse of the holy man. His lower half had been consumed. Ibbotson had organized a beat prior to this to locate and kill the leopard. He pulled together 200 men and they headed toward a promising plot of jungle. As the men beat the jungle in search of the leopard, word of the holy man's death reached the group. The beat was fruitless, so Ibbotson organized a larger beat, gathering 2,000 men this time. These men brought several guns with them and drums to make noise to scare the cat from cover. The group beat the rugged hill country, but yielded nothing again. The Alaknanda River Valley had two suspension bridges, which could be used to cross the river by humans or a desperate and hungry leopard. One of the bridges was in disrepair and had a floor that was slanted at a 45-degree angle in parts. Corbett doubted the leopard would use this bridge and opted to focus on the other, more stable bridge for his efforts. Corbett decided to return to Rudapriyag and see if he could locate the man-eater there. He purchased two goats and tied one a short distance up the pilgrim road, and the other he tied on a scrub trail where he had seen the leopard's tracks in the soil. He went to check the goats the next day, and the one on the scrub trail had been killed. 
This let Corbett know that the leopard was on this side of the river, so he set up to watch over the dead goat's carcass. As the evening approached, he climbed down from his perch and cut the tether, holding the goat in place. He walked back to the bungalow on full alert and rested for the night. The next day, at sunup, he stepped out onto the porch and looked down to the ground. In the soil toward the gate by his bungalow, he could see the distinct tracks of the leopard as it examined his dwelling. He began following the tracks which led to a wooded ravine near where the goat's body from the prior day was lying. Corbett walked to as many nearby villages as he could to let the occupants know the man-eater was on their side of the river and to take precautions. The next morning, just after breakfast, a very wound-up man ran up to the bungalow and informed Corbett that there had been a woman killed from a village just above the bungalow. Corbett immediately set out for the steep climb in the heat of the day, after grabbing needed equipment. Dripping in sweat, he arrived and began speaking with the woman's husband. It was evening time, and the couple had just finished dinner by fireside. He was just reclining for a relaxing smoke as his wife, who was advanced in pregnancy, carried the dishes to the door for washing. Just as she exited the door, the silverware and bowls clattered to the ground. It was dark outside, so the husband couldn't see what had occurred and called his wife. When she did not answer, he quickly shut and locked the door. Knowing he would risk his life only to recover the body of his dead wife and child did not make sense to him. His grief was obvious as he mourned both his wife and soon-to-be-born child. As Corbett investigated the story the husband provided, he examined the ground outside the door. As soon as the dishes clattered and after the husband yelled for his wife, the neighboring houses all shut and locked their doors so there were no witnesses. The distinct track of the large male leopard told the story, in the dirt. He had ambushed her just outside the door and dragged her a short distance into the open where he killed her between the set of row houses. Then he dragged her down a small ravine about one hundred yards near some fields and consumed her and her child. Corbett looked for a good place to lay in wait over her body for the return of the leopard and spotted a walnut tree with a hayrick built into it. He immediately set up there to watch. From where the pregnant woman's body was found, a narrow path slipped around the slope and into a ravine. Corbett found the same cat tracks in the path that he had found at the prior woman's kill site, and that had followed him after the bait sheep to the bungalow. It had the telltale bullet crease in its left rear paw pad. Corbett decided to set up a trap gun along this path. This is a simple trap that is set up with a gun, which is staked firmly to the ground and aimed at an anticipated point in a path. Then a trip string is run across the path to the trigger guard, round a series of smaller stakes. If it works like it should, the animal walks or runs down the path, pulling the string across the path tight as it walks by. This causes the string to tighten on the trigger and makes the gun go off. Depending on how it is staked down and properly aimed, plus a lot of other variables, it is a reliable way to hunt prey who are hard to find. It may sound like some kind of cartoon setup that Wiley e. Coyote might arrange on Bugs Bunny, and it is apparently dangerous to any human or animal, domestic or wild, that passes by, but it is a way to pursue dangerous predators without a confrontation directly. Corbett next placed a large white rock as a backdrop behind the anticipated route the leopard would take to return to the woman's body. He did this to increase the contrast between the animal and the background in the low-light environment at nighttime. He knew the light conditions may change, and having the white rock behind the leopard would give him a most reliable visual cue that the cat had returned to feed on the woman's corpse. Next, he hid in the straw of the hayrick. At evening time, Corbett crept into his hunting blind and began waiting for the leopard's return. As darkness settled like a blanket across the land, Corbett heard the cat near him, scratching up some straw into a makeshift bed to ride out a rainstorm that quickly blew in. Corbett wasn't so lucky as his position exposed him to the cold winds and rain, but he waited it out, and the weather soon improved. Corbett hadn't seen any movement in the area, but had noticed that the white rock was now obscured by something. It was too dark to make out any shapes, but the white rock was visible, and now it was not. Something was standing in front of it, blocking his view of it. As he craned his neck, searching for any sounds, he could hear the leopard chewing and licking the woman's body a few dozen yards away. Next, Corbett heard the cat quietly pad through the darkness and disappear under the rick the man was using for his blind. This happened three times, but without the white rock being obscured. 
Corbett was unable to get a shot before the leopard slinked back to lay down for another rest after eating a bit. Finally, the leopard returned to the woman's corpse, again to feed, and blocked the white rock from view. Corbett quickly fired at what he believed was its shoulder, and he could hear the leopard scrambling away through the brush. As the sun rose, Corbett crawled out of the hayrick and began examining the area near the woman's body. He walked over to where the, the path narrows and saw a bullet hole in the clay right in the middle of the path. There were bits of fur from the neck of the leopard on the ground around it, and he could tell by the characteristics of the hair that the leopard was old by the light color of it. The leopard did not leave a substantial blood trail and was apparently not shot in a vital area. The woman and her child's remains were cremated shortly thereafter. Corbett decided to check around the suspension bridges to see if the leopard had crossed to the other side of the valley. He couldn't find any sign that it had and immediately requested that the bridges be closed. To do this, the men placed thorn bushes in the opening on each side of the bridge and packed them in densely. Corbett staked out the blocked-off bridge for 20 days by hiding on the platform approaching the bridge. Accessing the bridge was no small feat, as apart from the steep trail, the last 20 feet or so required a climb up a flimsy bamboo ladder, which stopped 4 feet from the platform, forcing a near-vertical climb to reach the platform. As Corbett lay in wait, he was bitten by ants and bemused himself at the thought of being blown off the platform and onto the rocks several dozen yards below. Suddenly he saw a man with dark hair and a long dark beard, dressed in a long white gown, holding something up as he climbed the trail to the bridge. As the man approached, Corbett could see he was holding a large cross and wearing smaller silver ones around his neck. The men didn't talk but acknowledged each other with a wave. The man would take a few paces across the bridge, then stop for a moment, apparently praying as he went, then continue across the bridge. After he reached the other side, the man disappeared down the road toward the bazaar. Corbett saw the man a while later and asked what he was doing. The man indicated that he was praying that the evil spirit that was possessing the leopard would possess a tiger effigy that he was building. He planned to finish the effigy and float it down the river with the evil spirit inside of it, thus removing it from the area. Every morning, the man would arrive and work on the tiger effigy, just before Corbett would climb down for the day. After a few days' work, the man decided his effigy was complete. Corbett commented on how the effigy looked nothing like a tiger, and was about the same size as a horse. One hundred local village men helped the holy man lower the effigy to the river's edge, and they launched it with offerings of sweets and flowers, while blowing trumpets and banging gongs. The men who helped the apparent Christian were Hindus, who indicated they had no idea where the holy man had disappeared to after they launched the effigy. Corbett's friend and fellow hunters, Ibbotson, and his wife had arrived at the bungalow, so Corbett and his men set up camp in a tent behind a thornbush wall they had erected. A prickly pear tree with limbs hanging down was causing difficulty in erecting the tent properly, so Corbett had his men start to chop it down. After considering the tree would provide shade during the heat of the day, they opted to reconsider. They simply hacked some of the limbs hanging down away to finish the setup of the tent. This tree is very important to the events about to transpire, for it had long limbs that extended over the thorn fence and inside the defensive circle of the camp. As the group prepared to retire for the night, Corbett noticed this clear breach in their camp security too late in the day to correct it. As the men rolled out their beds for the night, the cook camp settled down toward the middle of the group. As Corbett slept, he was awakened by the sound of the leopard's claws digging into the bark of the prickly pear tree, and one of the branches cracked under the strain of its weight. He grabbed his rifle and jumped into his slippers in a sprint toward the cracking sound of the tree limb. The leopard was heard scattering through the bushes after the cook woke up and screamed. Corbett pursued it, but a jackal cry across the field told him that the cat was already out of his range. The cook recounted the occurrence from his view. As he slept, he was awakened by the branch cracking and opened his eyes to stare right into the face of the leopard, preparing to pounce on him. Fortunately, the confusion of Corbett running from his tent and the cook screaming had sent the leopard back to the anonymity of the scrub without incident. The next day, the prickly pear tree was cut down, and the men had no further problems with it while they camped there. Soon thereafter, the leopard terrorized nearby villages by trying to break into several huts at night. After not being able to gain access to one of the huts, the leopard broke into a barn and killed the farmer's cow. After eating a portion of that cow, it dragged its remains across the threshold halfway. This barn and house were in the middle of the village, which illustrated the leopard's boldness and lack of fear of any human. 
Corbett and his men knocked a hole in the upper story wall of an adjacent home to watch the dead cow from, but the leopard did not return to dine again. The tracks left at the scene had the same characteristics of the old large male they had become so familiar with. A day or so later, a second cow was killed, near a tall hayrick. It followed the same pattern of first trying to claw its way through the door of the home to get to the people. After that didn't work, it broke into the barn and killed the farmer's cow. It even dragged the carcass halfway across the threshold once again, just as before. Given that the hayrick was in an ideal position to hunt from, Corbett and his men commenced constructing a blind there. They put wire mesh around the structure and built an upper and lower platform, one for each of the hunters. In the wire mesh, the men wove straw so that the hayrick both blinded the cat's view and kept it from getting to the hunters quickly. They left only a single access from which they would enter the blind and securely lock themselves inside while they waited for the leopard to return. They did such a good job that the farmer, upon returning to see what they'd devised, couldn't even tell the hayrick had been modified. Ebbetson climbed into the upper seat, and Corbett took the lower deck, which was open to the ground just beneath the boards that supported him. The hunters waited for some time in complete silence, until they heard the leopard approaching, but it came in from just behind the hayrick they were hiding in. The cat stalked up and hid itself just beneath Corbett on the ground, four feet below him. As he prepared himself for a shot, Corbett heard a strange creaking sound above and behind him, and watched as the cat blurred a retreat into cover and away from them. Ibbotson had cramps flare up in both of his legs due to the position they were in, and had to adjust them, causing the board to creak and give away their position to the leopard. A few nights later, a man who lived by himself in a small hut a little ways from town had laid down for the night. He had built an informal dividing wall between the small bedroom and the kitchen in his hut recently, but it wasn't quite finished, nor was it very structurally sound. That night before bedtime, the man had neglected to lock his door and tumbled into bed, exhausted and ready to rest. In the middle of the night, he was awakened by the sound of the leopard already in his house, prying at the separating wall to get at him. He was too afraid to move and laid there in near panic as the cat pulled and clawed at the boards. Fortunately, the cat grew impatient and went to the barn and killed the man's cow. It dragged the cow's carcass down into a nearby ravine for the satisfaction of a meal in private. Again at this kill site was a hayrick mounted in a nearby tree and behind the tree was a trail descending into the ravine. Corbett and his men brought a newly acquired steel jaw trap with jaws that spanned 24 inches when set, and it weighed 80 pounds. They set the trap near the cow's carcass and directed the leopard's approach by burying thorn bushes on the downhill side of the carcass. They climbed up into the tree at the top of the ravine and waited, listening for the animals around them to sound an alert to the approaching leopard. Just after dark, a cacophonous roar broke the silence of the night down the ravine. Corbett turned on the flashlight just in time to see the leopard tugging against the trap as it was clamped onto one of his front paws. Corbett quickly fired his four fifty and snapped the chain holding the leopard in place, and it bounded down the hill with the affixed trap. Ibbotson fired two blasts from his shotgun as well, and Jim followed up with a shot from the other barrel of his rifle, fired out of disgust more than anything. Nearby villagers immediately started gathering, hoping that the leopard was dead as the men climbed out of the hayrick blind. Corbett and Ibbotson began trailing the leopard by oil lamp over a rock rise and into a small depression. They gazed into the rage-filled eyes of the leopard and exterminated it with a single shot to the head. The villagers began to dance and celebrate as they believed the man-eater had been killed and that the terror it had brought them was over. In the morning, the men began skinning the leopard, and Ibbotson was certain that this was the man-eater, despite it being smaller than what they'd expected. Corbett had his doubts, though, and discussed it privately with Ibbotson as soon as they arrived back at the bungalow. They had decided to depart to Pari the next day, but before they could pack their things, a man arrived to tell them a woman had been killed by a leopard on the far side of the river. The next morning, Ibbotson and Corbett packed their horses and headed out to the village, a guide led them into a deep ravine to a woman's body, which was under guard. The men noted that the leopard had licked her body clean of blood and had only eaten a few pounds of her flesh. She was young, maybe about twenty, and very healthy in appearance. The woman's husband was out of town, so Grandpa stayed with the woman and her recently born child. After nursing the baby in the evening time, the woman handed Grandpa the baby so that she could relieve herself outside. 
As soon as Grandpa had taken the baby from her arms, it started to cry, which muffled any other noise. After a few minutes, Grandpa called the woman's name and heard no reply. He called again and heard nothing in response. He immediately got up and closed and locked the door. As Corbett inspected the evidence at the hut, he could see where the leopard had laid in wait behind a small boulder about thirty yards to the front and right of the cabin door. It was probably listening to the murmur of conversation between the adults when the woman had to relieve herself and stepped outside. She'd squatted down with her back nearly completely blocking her view of where the leopard was hiding. The cat silently belly crawled about twenty yards to where the corner of the house obscured her seeing it. Then it crept along the wall of the house and attacked her. After killing her, it dragged her back to the rock. There it picked the 120-pound woman completely off the ground, leaving no evidence of any part of her dragging as it crossed a recently plowed field, down one embankment and across another field. Then it leapt down a 12-foot embankment without a single part of her leaving evidence of it touching the ground. At the foot of the embankment, it peeled her clothes from her body and licked it clean of blood. The hunters decided to set up a blind over her body to wait for the leopard to return to feed from it. They built the blind in an oak tree, about sixty yards away. As soon as the sun had begun to set, a kakar had sounded an alert from the direction of the jungle. Soon after that, a pine cone tumbled down the hill and struck the trunk of the tree right at Corbett's feet. This showed him that the leopard was approaching from the hill behind the tree, and it was using the tree for cover. This was the same tree the men had set their blind in. It was using the elevated vantage point in the same fashion the men had. Corbett and Ibbotson knew they would have to climb the hill to intercept the leopard. As they struggled up the steep hill, Ibbotson dropped the lantern, breaking it, even though it continued to work for a few more minutes. Having lost the initiative, the hunters started to head toward a thatched hut along the road. Upon arriving at the hut, the occupants would not open the door and Corbett threatened to burn the thatch if they didn't, for he feared the leopard was following them. Once again, the hunters could see twelve people taking shelter there. They produced a lamp, and Corbett and Ibbotson continued to find the hut their men were in. Just as they arrived, the men greeted them as they entered the courtyard and were climbing a set of stairs. A stray dog appeared and happily greeted the men also. Suddenly the dog turned and raised its hackles. It started barking and growling into the darkness just behind the hunters. At the base of the second floor wall, in the shadows cast by the light of the lantern, the leopard was hidden. As soon as the leopard had left the yard, the dog calmed down. Corbett and Ibbotson slept on the veranda as the dog faithfully stood guard until morning. At sunup, the hunters returned to the girl's body, but the leopard had not. Ibbotson had to take care of some urgent work, so he did that, while Corbett continued to search for the leopard on his own. The terrain he searched in was rough scrub, with large boulders and cliffs. There was plenty of game here, but the leopard was nowhere to be found. The hunters then returned to the woman's body and placed cyanide poisoning inside of it. They had also placed their steel jaw trap nearby to increase their chance of catching the man-eater. Again, they waited for the leopard to appear from the tree, but it didn't show up. The woman's body was taken for cremation, and the hunters departed the site of her attack. As the hunters were walking back toward the bungalow, some village men ran up and told them another cow had been killed by a leopard about four miles away. Since the hunters already had their trap and poison with them, they immediately headed toward the site of the leopard's latest kill. As the hunting party arrived at the farmer's house, he emerged to greet them. He pointed out the claw marks the leopard had left in his door as it tried to gain entry to kill him. The farmer had been remodeling a bit inside and had some sawn timbers, which he placed against the door to support it. The leopard had then broken into his barn and killed his cow after it couldn't get him. The cow's carcass laid with its back against a huge rose bush on one side and a small wall on the other. The hunters could see where the leopard had sat, perched on the wall as it ate from the carcass. They could reasonably assume that the leopard would do the same thing when it returned to feed that night. They dug out a hole to place the steel-jawed trap right under the spot where the leopard had been feeding on the carcass. They set it and covered it with dirt and leaves to hide it from the wary predator. Corbett then took an observation post in a tree nearby and waited for nightfall. At twilight, a small flock of pheasants had alerted, followed by a cacar running toward the men from the direction they expected the leopard to approach. Just before darkness set in, Corbett climbed out of the tree and headed back to town, not having seen the leopard once again. 
As he marched through the darkness, he couldn't shake the feeling that he was being followed. Upon approaching a small marsh, he bounded across the grassy mud and hid behind a medium-sized boulder to watch to see if anything came along. He waited about ten minutes, then emerged to return back to the farmhouse for some needed rest. While Corbett slept, the farmer shook him awake, saying that the leopard was clawing at the door. At sunup, they investigated the ground near the farmhouse and found the leopard's tracks. Corbett followed the tracks back to the small marsh he had hidden behind the boulder at. The leopard had followed each and every step he had taken, including the bounds across the muddy grass, to the concealment of the boulder. The tracks clearly went to the farmhouse and then back down to the cow carcass. When Corbett arrived at the cow carcass, he could see that it had been dragged from its original position. The track evidence showed that the leopard had resumed its position where it had eaten from before, just as the men hoped it would, but this time it placed its paws wider apart and just beyond the jaws of the buried trap. It had then walked all the way around the carcass, bit onto the cow's head, and dragged it a short distance to roll it into a small ravine. Corbett followed the tracks leading away from the carcass for about a mile before he lost the tracks in hard soil. After this exercise in frustration, Corbett decided to head over to the Nyany Tall for the winter to take his mind off of the leopard. During this time, Ibbotson had developed a bounty system that would provide locals with a reward of rupees for information regarding the leopard's activities and kills. During the three months of winter, the leopard killed ten more people. Corbett and Ibbotson returned to find out that the villagers made no attempt at killing the leopard while they were gone. Just two short days before their arrival, a ten-year-old boy was completely devoured by the leopard. Corbett once again closed the bridge across the Alaknanda River to isolate the cat to one side of the valley. Reports arrived to Corbett that a man by the name of Galru had been killed by the leopard while sleeping in his barn. His son had gone outside in the morning to find his blanket pulled halfway through the window and an apparent drag trail leading away into the jungle. Corbett requested a sketch of the tracks at the scene and received a very clearly drawn set of six circles filling a page. A search party was assembled consisting of 200 men and they scoured the area near the farm, trying to recover his body. Galru's body could not be located, but he soon turned up, alive and well. A group of villagers had placed him under arrest and led him back to town to his loud and vehement objections. He explained that he was mad at his daughter for paying more than she should for a farm animal and left in anger to visit his other daughter's house about ten miles away. It took a while for Corbett to coax a laugh from him after he explained all the chaos that ensued trying to find him. Ibbotson announced he had to leave for five days to tend to urgent business. After he left, the leopard had killed several domestic animals, but no people. At one of the cow carcasses, Corbett had set up to wait for the leopard to return, and it did. But before he could kill it, a woman from inside the house pounded on the door, frightening it away. A short time later, a woman reported that the leopard had tried to kill her while she slept beside her baby. She was sleeping on the floor when the leopard entered through the door and grabbed her by her arm. It dragged her across the floor toward the door, which woke up the woman. Instead of panicking, she waited until the leopard backed up and crossed the threshold and she pulled the door shut between her and the beast, forcing it to flee without killing and eating her. Her arm was cut up from the leopard's teeth, and she had deep bites on her breast. Her baby had a cut on her scalp, but both survived. Corbett laid in wait inside the room, hoping the leopard would return for her, but it never came back. Upon Ibbotson's return, a report of the leopard trying to break into another farmhouse came in. The hunters purchased a goat to use as bait and headed toward the farmhouse to find the man-eater. They had spotted a promising area with caves and boulder fields that would be ideal for a leopard to sleep during the day, between nights of hunting. They tethered the goat in the open and hid amongst the boulders to watch for the leopard. Soon the goat stopped bleeding and backed up to the length of the tether holding it. It shook its head and pulled on the tether. From their vantage point, each hunter took turns using Ibbotson's scoped rifle to examine the brush around the goat but couldn't locate the leopard. As dark began to set in, the men rounded up the goat and started up the trail back toward the farmhouse. The goat didn't want to be led by the rope, so they took it off from its neck, and immediately the goat bolted in the opposite direction down the trail. The men pursued it, but it quickly disappeared around a bend in the trail. The hunters concluded that the goat was going to take a shortcut back to the village and started back up the trail. After walking for about 15 minutes, Corbett could see something white in the trail 
ahead of them through the darkness. Being unsure as to what it was, he approached the object cautiously. It was the goat that had just fled from them, but was now lying dead in the middle of the trail, with blood oozing from its neck. As Corbett ran his hands over the carcass, its muscles still twitched in the throes of death. It had obviously been killed just before their approach. Corbett felt the leopard had placed the goat on the trail to send the men a message. He pulled a mostly full set of kitchen matches from his pocket, and the men navigated the dark, covering as much ground as they could as each match burned, striking one after another until they arrived at the outskirts of the village. Once there, they yelled and requested a lantern be brought quickly, and they safely returned to the village for the rest of the night. At sunup, Corbett returned to the goat carcass from the night before. He could see the tracks of the leopard there and followed them, as they followed his tracks the night before. The leopard had tracked the men along the trail back to the village while leaving the goat carcass completely untouched. It then proceeded back to the goat carcass and followed a trail up a hill and found a man sleeping. It killed him while he slept. The dead man's neighbor, named Nand Ram, reported hearing his neighbor crying in the middle of the night. Inquiring as to what was wrong, the family told Nand that a leopard had dragged away the man of the household in the middle of the night. The man's name was Gawi, and he'd been sitting on the threshold of his home. The leopard ambushed him, clamping its jaws around his throat and dragging him off about 100 yards to kill him. Then it dragged his dead body another quarter of a mile, where it consumed part of his corpse. The loud laments of the women had apparently scared the leopard from consuming any more of the man's corpse. The hunters again set up a blind to watch over the man's body. They had set poison inside the body, as well as hoping it would kill the leopard, if they didn't have a chance. They watched over it for a few hours, and then opted to return to the bungalow for more rest. In the morning, the hunters returned to the man's corpse. They had poisoned three locations on the man's body where the cat previously fed, but now noticed that the leopard had eaten around the poison parts of his body. Corbett decided to position himself overlooking the body from a tree. On the path below, the leopard's tracks pressed into the soil as the full moon illuminated the night brilliantly. At about 8 p.m., a cacar sounded a bark as it was alarmed by the leopard as it arrived at the man's corpse to feed again. The cat approached this time using a different route than the trail previously used. A few hours later, at 10 p.m., the cacar barked again, telling Corbett that the cat had left the corpse. As it departed the man's body, Corbett could hear the footfalls as it approached the tree he was in to access the trail below. Prior to climbing the tree, the hunter had scattered dried leaves over the trail so that he could hear the leopard walking on it. The leopard never came out of cover as it approached, but he heard it jog past underneath the tree and made a beeline for the spring pool below him. He could hear the leopard lapping at the water for some time when it dawned on him that the poison had created the thirst in the leopard. Corbett stayed in the tree all night, and Ibbotson returned to fetch him in the morning. Before departing, the men examined the man's corpse, and could see the leopard had consumed the poison portion of his body in the night. Now aware the leopard was poisoned, and maybe too weak to elude capture or death, they gathered two hundred men to beat the hillside and flush the leopard from cover. About a half mile away, they located a depression dug up by the cat, where he vomited the toes of the dead man intact. There were large boulders all around the area, and the toes were vomited up just outside of the mouth of a small cave, just big enough for a leopard to shelter inside of. The men knew they had the man-eater cornered inside the cave, and quickly set about packing it with thorn bushes and rocks to keep it inside. In the morning, they returned with wire mesh to replace the rocks and thorn bushes, blocking the mouth of the cave. They visited the mouth of the cave daily to search for signs the leopard had escaped, or for the stench of a rotting animal being emitted from the cave. For ten days, all was quiet in the valley, and there were no human nor livestock deaths. On the tenth day, the wire mesh lay undisturbed, but a woman from a nearby village had been killed by a leopard. They could see the leopard's hairs rubbed off on the cave walls, and they fit the description of the light, bristly hairs of the old male. After the leopard was poisoned, its desire for human flesh grew immensely, possibly out of rage for his tormentors. Corbett struggled to understand how the leopard had escaped the cave and survived the poisoning. He came to the conclusion that the cave may have had a second entrance hidden further up the hill, still undiscovered by the hunters. He also decided that perhaps the leopard had consumed too much cyanide, causing the vomiting of the poison before it could have taken a lethal effect on the cat. 
After so many false hopes of having killed the man-eater, the villagers seem to have awe regarding its perceived supernatural powers to escape death and claim victims. They would continually claim that only fire would cleanse the land of this evil spirit. Once they had learned the leopard was sealed in the cave and poisoned, they would begin to let their guard down, resuming activities they had previously avoided during the vulnerable hours. This is what led to the latest victim's death. Corbett set out for the location of the leopard's latest kill to investigate and see if he could again get a chance at stopping the death toll tallied by the cat. At the location of the attack, he found large pools of blood with evidence of a struggle having occurred. The woman had apparently entered the door of her home and was in the process of closing the door behind her when the leopard descended upon her. It dragged her 100 yards on her back while she screamed for help to a nearby trail junction where she again resisted by fighting back. Her neighbors were too frightened to help her and eventually it killed her there. The leopard carried the woman's body through a barren field and then over a 100 yard wide ravine and a further 200 yards up another hill. The only sign the hunters had to follow was her blood trail, as no part of her body dragged on the ground. Again, the leopard stripped her body of its clothes before leaving her corpse below a wild rose bush, from which petals fell, creating a macabre artistic scene. The victim was a 70-year-old woman with gray hair. Ibbotson left to replenish their supplies as Corbett continued to pursue the leopard. When they reunited, they looked over the land and discussed the details of the woman's death. The leopard attacked her just before sunup and dragged her initially, then left after eating smaller portions of her flesh. Corbett asserted that it escaped along a very discreet route to find rest afterward. As they searched the area, they discovered the leopard's tracks and a bed where it had slept. Corbett laid in the bed and searched the nearby scrub brush for movement or any other clues. As he surveyed the patch of scrub near the bed, he could see it was surrounded by cliffs, impossible for the leopard to leap up. But there was a cleft in the cliff that he was certain would be its escape route. He watched as a small flock of scimitar babblers picked through the leaves as they searched for grubs. These birds would be a great alarm if the leopard was on the move. Corbett descended to the bottom of the scrub patch and began zigzagging his way up toward the cliffs. He listened for the scimitar babblers to announce the leopard's movements as he continued his back-and-forth route. Suddenly the scimitar babblers began alerting Corbett that the leopard was moving toward the cleft for an escape up the cliff. He raided his rifle and had a very clear shot as it made its jump. Corbett's rubber-soled boots slipped in some mud just as the leopard made his leap into the cleft and to its escape. Once again, the man had missed a chance to bring the carnage to an end, disappointingly. Ibbotson arrived soon thereafter, and with new supplies at about 2 p.m. The hunter set up a trap gun near the woman's body and placed more poison inside of it. They also placed the steel-jawed trap nearby. They built a hunting blind in a mango tree a short distance away from the woman's body and sat up to wait for the leopard to return. That night the leopard did not return, but at 7.45 p.m. the following evening, just as it began to rain, circumstances changed. The hunters were discussing the possibility of the rain setting off the steel-jawed trap as it was set to snap shut with the slightest disturbance. Suddenly an enormous roar emanated from the trap area, and then silence. They decided to circle around above the trap to check it by lamplight. They could see that significant portions of the woman had been consumed, but the trap was not holding the leopard. They were briefly dismayed at the thought it had escaped, when through the meager light they could see the trap several yards down the hill, sprung and empty. The hunters then returned to their blind in the mango tree and fell asleep. In the morning a light rain pattered the ground as the hunters disembarked the blind. As they looked over the area they could see the leopard had approached from the downhill side, where they had buried thorn bushes to guide its approach into the trap guns and the steel-jawed trap. The leopard had torn the thorn bushes from their place and dragged the woman's corpse toward the trap guns, putting slack in their trigger lines. It then consumed the portion of her body away from the trap gun, tethered to her body. It ate portions of her body that had not been poisoned, and carefully avoided the portions that had been. As it left, the leopard strode right over the steel-jawed trap, which snapped shut on its left hind leg, just above the knee. The track evidence showed it bounded down the slope several yards before somehow dislodging the trap from its leg. 
As the men searched for a logical explanation as to how the leopard had escaped such a strong trap, the flaw became glaringly obvious to them. It was then that he recalled that as the men had carried the trap to their location, it fell from the horse, and one of the three-inch teeth were broken off at the base. It just so happened that the gap in the teeth of the trap lined up with the leopard's leg bone, creating enough room for it to be pulled from the jaws of the trap. All that was left behind after the man-eater had pulled itself free was several of its bristly hairs and a small patch of skin. The hunters found the leopard's tracks after it had slipped out of the trap. It meandered down below the mango tree in which they were hiding, and at the time probably climbing down from, then on for five more miles back toward the bungalow. Back near the location where the twelve-year-old girl was snatched from her bed while her uncle and father calmed their buffalo herd, Another goat herder arrived and pinned his herd in the thorn fence for the night. He arrived late in the evening, well after dark, and repaired the holes in the thorn fence before retiring for the evening. One of his most prized goats somehow escaped from the thorn fence and wandered toward the narrow strip of land connecting the field to the road, where it was ambushed and killed by the leopard. It was a big goat, with a beautiful silver sheen to its coat, and by far the favorite of the shepherd. The cat consumed no flesh from the goat, simply leaving its carcass alongside the road and continued on its journey. After following the leopard tracks to the bungalow, then down toward the thorn fence corral, then on toward a deep ravine, totaling eight miles in distance, Corbett returned to chat with the shepherd about the leopard, and as they spoke, a dark creature came over the horizon of the adjacent mountain toward them. The men first speculated that it may be a bear, but within a few seconds identified it as a wild boar. The boar was followed by a pack of dogs and a group of young men with sticks in hot pursuit. A few seconds later, a hunter with a rifle crested the same hill and shot his rifle at what couldn't possibly have been the boar, as it was out of range by then. The hunting party proceeded down the hillside to where the boar had holed up in a small stand of scrub brush. The dogs would rush the scrub, but yelp back and retreat after feeling the purposeful end of the boar's tusks. After prompting the young men to flush the boar and being rebuffed, the hunter sat down on a rock and proceeded to light up a cigarette while waiting for one of the younger men to drive the boar from cover. From their vantage point, Corbett and the shepherd could see the boar emerge from the far end of the scrub and dive headlong into the rushing waters of the Ganges River. They watched it struggle against the waters for nearly half a mile while slowly making progress toward the opposite bank. A brief discussion ensued about why Corbett had fired his rifle to bring the chase to an end, after which he quipped that he had come to kill a man-eating leopard, not assist in a pig hunt. The two men bid adieu and parted ways to continue on their tasks for the day. Shortly thereafter, the leopard tried breaking into another house in a nearby village. Arriving on the scene to investigate, Corbett found the all-too-familiar tracks of the old leopard, which led away toward a mountain. He followed the tracks for a while until he came upon a large boulder protruding into the valley, which made an ideal observation point. Corbett climbed up on the rock and began looking around to see if he could learn something useful about the terrain the leopard decided to enter. Fogg had hidden some detail of the area, but a quick rainstorm cleared that up and revealed an amazing and far-reaching view to the man. Two men suddenly appeared behind Corbett and began chatting with him. After learning he was pursuing the man-eater, they offered to bring him a goat for bait. They said they would be back in two hours with the animal, which he found helpful and promising. True to their word, the men arrived, goat in tow. Corbett decided to stake the goat beneath a large pine tree, which he planned to climb and observe from it. The men laughed at him when he told them his plan, but seemed impressed when he managed to do what he told them he would do. They tethered the goat to the stake and said their goodbyes as they went on their way, promising to check on him the following day as they returned. The man had reassured Corbett that the goat was a good caller and would bleat, attempting to find the rest of its herd, but to his disappointment, the goat laid down just after dark and went to sleep. He decided to call the leopard himself and produce the sound of a female leopard seeking a male. His call was answered by a male leopard only about 400 yards up the hill. The wary male started to circle toward Corbett along the hill to where it was just uphill from him, and now too close for Corbett to call it again for fear of giving his location away. Then a female leopard began calling from across the small valley, enticing the male to follow her. The male likely thought the female had simply moved locations and quickly started to close the distance toward her. Corbett listened as the leopards called to each other as they headed further up the hill, where he could hear their courting calls to one another in the distance. During the night, a strong windstorm blew in, nearly knocking over the tree Corbett was hiding in. 
He managed to hang on for dear life, and in the morning, the two men who brought him the goat returned. After a brief conversation, the men went on about their business, as did Corbett. Several days after the incident in the pine tree, Corbett found neither hide nor hair of the leopard. Thinking that the leopard had finished courting and mating with the female, then somehow must have wandered to the other side of the river, he set out again for the bridge. As Corbett approached a familiar house along the trail to the bridge, he was greeted by the family dog, who had always been happy to see him. He greeted the dog with affection and continued on his route toward the bridge. Soon thereafter, the leopard caught that dog and killed him, leaving his carcass on the trail, uneaten. Corbett inspected the area around the bridge and did not see any evidence of the leopard crossing the bridge to the other side of the valley. Upon returning near the house, Corbett found the tracks of the man-eater and followed it for about a mile before losing it in hard soil. Two days later, and about seven miles further up the Pilgrim's Road, another cow was killed by the leopard. Again, the cat tried to gain entry into the house and, having failed, killed the farmer's cow. The men bringing the report to Corbett brought him tea as well, and they all reclined in the shade of a mango tree for a smoke break together. In turn, each of the men shared his own harrowing tale of a narrow escape from the leopard. They relayed information that indicated the cat was waiting outside of houses to ambush people, but had only recently adopted the practice of breaking into houses to get at the people inside. They told him that the leopard was also known to dig through earthen walls to gain access to the house, or sometimes to dig under the wall for the same purpose. They told him of one woman who was dragged across the floor toward the door while she was sleeping. As the woman with the baby had done, who was attacked in similar fashion, this woman also waited until the leopard had backed out of the door past the threshold and shut the door, leaving her arm clenched in its mouth. The leopard managed to sever her arm before she could shut it and lock the door. Following the repartee, Corbett proceeded toward the latest kill by the leopard. The carcass was in a deep ravine about a quarter mile from the road. He examined the terrain and quickly decided to sit over the cow carcass and wait for the leopard. He found a medium-sized boulder about 30 yards from the carcass with a hollow just big enough to conceal himself within it. With him he carried his fixed-blade knife, his hunting rifle, and a flashlight. As he waited for the leopard to return, the twilight blurred the objects surrounding him. This time of year was dry and made it easy to hear animals as they moved around. This setting seemed very optimal, and Corbett felt positive about his chances of killing the leopard. As he waited, he began to wonder if the leopard had been hidden among the boulders on the opposite side of the ravine. Perhaps it had watched him hide himself in the hollow and was planning a stealthy ambush to make him its next meal. Soon thereafter, rain began to fall and make noise and movement all around him. Corbett began to grow concerned about the uncertainty of the location of the leopard and removed his coat and tied it around his neck by its sleeves, hoping it would add some protection from teeth penetrating it. As the light faded, the man began to ponder the history of his hunting knife, now held in his right hand. He had bought the knife from a shop, and it was known as an Afridi stabbing knife. On its handle were marked three notches, one for each person it was used to murder. By the time dark had fallen across the land, shooting time had well passed leaving only his knife for protection against the leopard. He clenched the murderer's knife in his right hand and his rifle in his left. He considered how leopards do not like rain and prefer to lay up and wait it out, but there was nothing ordinary about this man-eater. It was very unpredictable and seemed to think like a man, or at least anticipate what they might do or where they might be. He recalled the conversation he'd had with his friend before departing, and it began to haunt him. He indicated that he would not be back before shooting the leopard, which meant that he could expect no one to come searching for him any time soon. He knew the road was only about 500 yards above him along the trail out of the ravine. About half of it was now a slippery clay trail, but the last bit was hardened and stony. If he emerged from the hollow, he would give himself away to the leopard, which may be watching him, and perhaps have to confront it on less than ideal terms. But if he stayed in the hollow, would he be risking being stalked upon by the leopard having watched him ease his way into the hollow? He opted to exit the hollow and proceed through the dark, up to the road. He didn't use his flashlight for fear the cat would notice that more than if he'd simply walked out without it. He covered the route to the road safely and yelled out a triumphant cooey as he arrived at the road. His victory yell caused Mado Singh to open the door and flash a lantern around in the darkness in investigation of the noise. The men with Singh walked the seven miles through the darkness back to Rudipriyag with Corbett. When they started their return trip in the morning, they found the leopard's tracks pressed into the clay right beside their own. 
They couldn't tell how much time between each of the tracks overlapped, but it was certain the leopard had followed them either way. As the hunters retraced the leopard's tracks, they could see that it had followed the men to Rue de Priog, then down the Pilgrim Road a while, and eventually up to the trail to Eredor. In the months between the snow melt and the snowfall, the Pilgrim's Road is open to travel, and for the warm months, thousands of people make the journey each year. Over the past eight years, the leopard had killed seven pilgrims while they were making their journey through this area. Corbett and his partners had timed the leopard as it completed the circuit it considered its territory. It would cover a 15-mile loop every five days or so. Now aware of its habits, Corbett decided to set up a watch over the trail from a hayrick nearby. The leopard never came by under that watch, nor would they hear anything about it for two days. Corbett visited as many villages as he could walk to in a 12-mile tour of the valley, asking villagers for any information regarding the leopard or problems it may be causing. About 18 miles away, near the village of Benswara, a boy was killed by the leopard. This information was collected through Ibbotson's Information Collecting Network, which was paying dividends by now. The reward system paid two rupees for information regarding goat deaths, and up to twenty rupees for information regarding attacks on people. After hearing about the boy's death, Corbett and a companion left for the village by foot at 1 p.m. just after lunch. The trail to the remote village was rugged and wound around mountain drops and along high passes posing its own danger. After arriving at Benswara, the guide and Corbett listened to the recounting of the attack. A widow and her son and daughter, along with a neighbor's son, were fetching water from the nearby spring to prepare dinner. They filled their vessels and walked the short distance back toward the row houses that the residents lived in. The neighbor boy was first in line with his water vessel and noticed what he thought was a dog laying in the shade in an open room just atop the front walkway of the building. He paid it no mind as it was not uncommon to see dogs laying around the area. The other members of the small party walked past the room as well, and the widow's son was last in line, struggling to carry the large brass vessel now filled with water. As the widow proceeded just ahead of the boy, she heard a clatter behind her as the brass vessel clanged on the rock pathway and turned to chastise her son for being careless. As she turned around after putting her vessel on the ground, she saw nothing there but the vessel. Neighbors emerged from their adjacent houses with lanterns to investigate what the clatter and yelling were about. As one of the men approached, he pointed out a blood trail leading away from the brass vessel, previously cloaked by the dark of night. An older man, who had some experience hunting, grabbed a lantern and followed the blood trail across the courtyard over a low wall, then dropped eight feet into a yam field. They could see leopard tracks in the soil of the field and realized the man-eater had struck again. The widow immediately began wailing in sorrow as the village men scattered to get guns and drums to beat to scare the cat away. In the morning, the boy's body was recovered and a messenger was sent to let Corbett know about the killing. While describing the events, the widow expressed bitter disappointment towards the men of the village, saying that if the boy's father were alive, he would not have hesitated to pursue the leopard. Corbett told her that they knew there was nothing to be done to save the boy's life, as the leopard had immediately broken his neck and killed him. He listened as the villagers stated that no one in the village saw the leopard, even though it carried the boy's body across an open courtyard. They also reported that none of the village dogs barked alerting them to the man-eater's presence, which was very odd. Corbett followed the tracks and could see the leopard had carried the boy across the yam field, then down a few retention walls and leaped a large rose bush. After arriving at a cattle trail, the leopard put the boy's body down and rested. He anticipated that that was when the villagers began beating their drums, as the leopard left to cover immediately. It didn't return to the boy's body to feed as the drums were beaten all night long. As Corbett examined the area around the body for a safe place to build a blind, he couldn't find a satisfactory place. He couldn't plan to watch from the ground because both tigers and leopards are far too fast to shoot with a firearm from the ground with cover. Corbett went back to the courtyard and pried up one of the large flagstones toward the middle of it. There he drove a large stake into the ground. The boy's body was carried up to the courtyard and chained to the stake so Corbett could watch over it that night. As the hunter settled in, now hidden behind some straw on the veranda of the building, overlooking the courtyard. He figured the leopard would return that night, 
and having found the boy's body missing, would retrace his steps back to the courtyard. As Corbett lay in wait for the leopard, at 8 p.m. a lightning storm blew in and lit up the sky brilliantly. Thunder echoed throughout the valley, and rain soaked everything it touched. The hunter knew that the leopard would take shelter during the storm, so as soon as the rain stopped, he began anticipating how long it would take it to arrive. It would leave its shelter when the rain stopped, and would travel toward where it left the boy's body, so it would take a few hours to complete this route. After encouraging the villagers to be silent, he could still hear the widow crying, but her sobs eventually faded as silence enveloped the village like the darkness had. The sky was still overcast, so the moonlight was limited and details were hard to make out. As Corbett lay in his straw bed, listening for the movement of the chain attached to the boy's body on the stone, he felt fur tickle along the bare calf of his leg, beneath his shorts. The leopard had somehow circled back behind him and was now standing over him, preparing to administer a killing bite to his neck. Just as he was planning on firing his rifle to create a distraction to divert the leopard's attack, a sopping wet kitten leaped into his arms. This was the source of the tickle alongside his calf. The kitten apparently tried to escape the rain, but found all the doors shut tight, and now petitioned the man for the warmth inside his shirt. Just as the surprise of the kitten was wearing off, Corbett heard a low growl emanate from the small valley past the low wall bordering the courtyard. This growl quickly turned into the screaming challenges of two male leopards vying for territory. Corbett knew by the direction and volume of the growls and screams that the battle was happening near where the boy's body had been left by the leopard. The leopard had returned to eat the boy's body and had found the only other male leopard in this vast area. Bianswara was about ten miles outside of the man-eater's regular territory, so he was trespassing on another male leopard's feeding and breeding grounds. From the sounds of the fight, the man-eating intruder was not winning. There were four distinct rounds to the bout, and apparently the younger male was giving the older leopard more than he could handle. The fight scene tumbled several hundred yards down the hill until the racket raised by it faded into the darkness of the night. Corbett knew at this point that the leopard would not be visiting the courtyard that night, even if he had won the fight. It is rare that male leopards actually end up fighting over territory, as the costs of losing or even fighting this battle may be their life. They typically size each other up for a while before the weaker or more timid male slinks away and searches for another area to claim. This confrontation most likely happened due to the surprise of finding each other and the expectation of food. Aware of this, Corbett expected the man-eater to be severely injured, and most likely would head back toward Rudra Prayag and his familiar territory. The kitten slept blissfully unaware of the battle happening in the bush, and the disappointment rising in Corbett's heart about the missed opportunity. He placed the boy's corpse in a shed and covered it with a blanket. He informed the village leader of the fight and that the leopard would be leaving his area and no longer threaten the residents. Corbett had a long, arduous journey ahead of him to mull over the details of the night. It made the journey seem twice as long and exhausting. He strategized what to do next as he stepped his way up steep trails and down the valley paths. He expected the leopard to lay low for a few days to heal his wounds and gather his strength again. The details that pained him most were how the leopard always seemed to escape, and how odd occurrences continually ensured its safety. It had escaped trap after trap, ate poison and not died, been penned in a cave, and somehow escaped to kill again. As he passed through village after village, residents asked him if he had succeeded in stopping the man-eater. After he relayed the disappointing news, they never seemed to lose faith in his abilities, nor did they express any regret in his efforts. They expressed in verbal and nonverbal ways that he was their only hope for relief from the man-eater. In the final village before completing his return, Corbett was offered and gratefully accepted a pot of tea. As he left the village to complete the last four miles of his journey, it wasn't long before he could see the indelible tracks of the leopard on the path ahead of him. In a nearly poetic turn of events, he was now following the leopard after its greatest defeat. After a half a mile, the leopard's tracks indicated that it had picked up its pace. As Corbett followed the tracks into a large ravine near Golabri, where it most likely hid for the daytime, this indicated to Corbett that the cat had probably navigated the trail in the early morning hours and sought out the ravine at daybreak. Back at the bungalow, Corbett slept for a while, then ate breakfast and enjoyed a bath to wash away the trail mud and dust. 
Now renewed a bit, he headed back to the Pilgrim shelter at the base of the Pilgrim Trail, where he spoke with the owner. He indicated that there had been a pilgrim arriving far too late at night. His shelter was booked up and he had no room, directing her further along the trail to the next shelter. She begged him to allow her to stay here as she was exhausted. He permitted her to stay in a shed with some other pilgrims staying there and she rolled out her carpet toward the middle of the group. In the middle of the night, one of the women on the edge of the sleeping group of pilgrims screamed out in pain and claimed that a scorpion had struck her foot. A lantern was lit and the injury was examined. The other pilgrims told her it couldn't have been a scorpion because a scorpion sting does not bleed that much, if any. The other pilgrims grumbled as they returned to their mats to complete their night's rest. In the morning, the owner went outside and found a blood-soaked sari in the road in front of the shed the pilgrims had slept in. The pilgrims investigated and could see that the leopard had stepped over many of the sleeping pilgrims to approach the woman who arrived late last night. It bit her by the neck, then carried her body over the other still sleeping pilgrims. As it prepared to leap from the platform, its rear claw cut the woman who woke up screaming and complaining of a scorpion bite. In an attempt to figure out why that woman was chosen, Corbett and the shelter owners discussed how she was the last to arrive, but the hardest to access. The factors that may have differentiated her from the other pilgrims were that she wore colorful clothing and she was from the mountain country, which may have been a familiar smell to the leopard. Apart from that, the men were at a loss to explain why she was chosen over the other pilgrims. The shelter owner suggested that perhaps the woman's fear drew the leopard to her in some mystical way. The shelter owner wasted no time in relaying his own encounter with the man-eater. He stated that it occurred about four years before he and Corbett met. In 1921, during the heat of the summer, a large group of pilgrims arrived at his shelter. He tried to encourage them to continue to a safe shelter two miles further on the trail, but they insisted on staying with him. He was concerned that having a pilgrim killed by the man-eater would be bad for his business, so he told them they would stay with him in his second-floor house. The pilgrims crowded into his home, which had no venting and quickly became overwhelmingly stifling. In the middle of the night, the owner stepped outside onto the porch for some fresh night air. As he refreshed himself, he placed each hand on the pillar on either side of the stairway leading up to the house. Just after taking in a large, refreshing breath, he could feel his throat being crushed by the jaws of the leopard, which had descended upon him with no noise at all. He kept his hands placed on the pillars to help resist the leopard from pulling him down the stairs. He then placed his feet on the body of the leopard and forcefully ripped his own throat from the teeth now puncturing his flesh. In a burst of adrenaline, the man hurled the cat down the stairs and feeling faint leaned over the handrail to the right of the stairwell. As he struggled for consciousness, the leopard leapt up and sank its claws into the man's left forearm. He countered the downward pull of the leopard claws by placing his elbow against the railing and pushing with his right hand. The full weight of the leopard was pulling against his forearm which caused its claws to slash their way down his arm and out of his wrist. Having overheard the commotion on the porch, some of the pilgrims emerged from the house and witnessed the shelter owner with his throat torn out but still standing. They led him inside and laid him on a bed. He was bleeding profusely and struggling to breathe gasping through the huge open wound in his neck. The leopard continually assaulted the door for the remainder of the night trying to finish off the man. The pilgrims were terrified by the noise and aggression of the leopard as it periodically struck the door. By morning, the shelter owner had lost consciousness, so the pilgrims carried him two miles down the trail to the hospital. He convalesced in the hospital for three months, while being fed through a silver straw inserted into his throat. After six months, he returned to his shelter with gray hair from the stress of the event and having been robbed of his health. The shelter owner always referred to the leopard as an evil spirit, and Corbett humored his claims, as he had no evidence to prove otherwise. At the end of their conversation, Corbett made sure to ask the shelter owner to warn his patrons before carrying on his way. That night, Corbett set up a blind in the mango tree, just below the shelter owner's house. After four days, Ibbotson joined him in the blind for conversation. He always brightened Corbett's mood and encouraged him, so his visit was welcomed. They agreed that to time the leopard circuit around the valley, it would be necessary to sit in the blind for ten days. This would give them at least two opportunities to kill the man-eater as it passed by every five days or so. 
Corbett relayed to his friend that this would be his last effort to eliminate the leopard, and that he would back away from its pursuit to allow other hunters to try. He would return to Ninital at the end of the ten days. The two hunters waited up in the blind that night above a goat with a bell around its neck, tethered to a stake for bait. As Ibbotson lounged in the blind up in the mango tree, Corbett smoked on a rock near the trunk as he chatted with the shelter owner. The shelter owner tried to convince him to stay in the comfortable bed inside, but Corbett would have none of it, opting to sleep each of the ten remaining nights in the blind so he wouldn't miss the leopard. Each morning Ibbotson's men would arrive and escort Corbett back to the bungalow to rest and rejuvenate his energy, then they would return with him in the evening time, leaving him to kill the leopard. During nine nights of failure and dejection, the leopard took a sheep and a goat from nearby farms. After killing each of these animals, the leopard would carry their carcass long distances, ensuring to Corbett that it would not return to consuming the scraps. While he hunted from the mango tree, the area press pilloried Ibbotson and Corbett for their lack of success in bringing the leopard's killing streak to an end. They demanded local hunters be allowed to pursue the man-eater even though none took them up on their offer. Corbett's spirit sank as his last day approached, and he had no success whatsoever in effecting the leopard's rampage. He had already pushed back work in Africa by three months to pursue the leopard, and Ibbotson had work piling up on his desk back at the office. They felt defeated and considered cutting their losses, but agreed to wait to discuss it further in the morning. Corbett climbed into the hunting blind by himself the last night and watched as the owner passed by with a pail of milk. The owner informed the hunter that he had 150 pilgrims scheduled to stay at the shelter that night. A while later, Corbett watched one of the disobedient pilgrims carry a lantern across the road in the dark and relieve himself in the bushes and return to the shelter. Just downhill from where the pilgrim had relieved himself was a shepherd's camp with his herds tethered for the night. A few minutes after the pilgrim had crossed the road and re-entered the shelter, the shepherd's dogs began barking at something down the road. This was confirmation to Corbett that the leopard was approaching his position. Soon thereafter, the dogs were barking directly toward his position in the blind, indicating that the leopard was very close to him and the goat. The man-eater may have seen the pilgrim cross the road with the lantern, and was now angling to find entry to the shelter to kill another human. Corbett considered that the leopard had seen the tethered goat beneath him. It seemed now to be approaching the goat from the cover along Corbett's side of the road, and he expected it to use the mango tree for cover to close the short distance from there, but also considered that the shelter was just behind him as well. Beneath the mango tree, the moonlight was filtered out and few details were discernible in its shadow. Corbett couldn't make out what was going on beneath his tree, so he closed his eyes to focus on the sounds around him. It was then that he heard a gentle rustle beneath his tree, and the bell of the goat sounded as it moved backward away from the leopard. Right then, Corbett switched on the flashlight tied to his rifle. As the light illuminated the darkness, he could see the sights of his rifle already aligned on what appeared to be the leopard's shoulder. He quickly pulled the trigger and the rifle kicked, switching the flashlight off. Corbett tried to turn the light back on as he heard the brush near the far edge of the road part as the leopard fled through it. The flashlight flicked but did not turn back on and Corbett focused on listening to hear what was going on. The report of the rifle drew the shelter owner onto the porch, waving a lantern while he asked if everything was all right. Corbett didn't respond as he listened to what sounded like gurgling sounds a short distance away from the road. Corbett had no way to confirm his shot placement as his flashlight appeared to have a dead battery. Without his response, the shelter owner quickly returned to the safety of the house and audibly locked the door behind him. In the dark, Corbett sorted through the events in his mind. He had seen the leopard leap over the goat in the split second as he fired his rifle. He recalled hearing the thrashing in the brush just off of the shoulder of the road, and then the gurgling noise afterward. As he continued to crane his neck, listening for details, he could hear the bell of the goat tingling below him. This confirmed that the cat had not quite reached the goal in a deadly manner before the shot. He fired his rifle at 10 p.m. and knew there would be several hours to wait before even the moonlight would brighten the shadows, let alone daybreak. Having nothing else to do, Corbett pulled out his cigarettes and had a smoke while he marked the passing of the hours. He tried to calm himself in the dark silence. It took a few hours, but the full moon finally rose directly overhead, bringing the relief of at least some light. 
Corbett climbed the mango tree to get a better vantage point on the direction the leopard had fled, but the leaves and branches obscured his view. After a few more long hours, the sun finally broke the horizon, flooding the area with light. The features of the land slowly regained their character just before Corbett slowly climbed down from his blind in the mango tree. The goat gently bleated good morning and his gratitude to Corbett as the man strode toward the shoulder of the road, where he heard the leopard rushing through the scrub. On a large flat rock a few yards off the road, a one-inch wide continuous ribbon of blood crossed its width. Corbett knew any animal bleeding that severely couldn't have gone far. Corbett abandoned typical precautions as he clambered down the slope past the large rock. He soon found the blood trail and followed it about fifty yards down the hill and into a small depression. There in the hole lay the leopard's body in repose. Its head protruded slightly from the hole and its eyes rested half-closed and still. It was definitely a large older male, paled by advanced age. But was it the man-eater that had so terrorized the villagers for the past several years? As he looked over the carcass of the leopard, all his past conceptions of the man-eater began to fade. He no longer saw the conniving and cunning animal seeking a way to avenge itself on him for harassing it for so long. He didn't see a monster with blood-soaked lips, the evil spirit he imagined as he lay on the veranda above the courtyard while watching the boy's body disappeared, and he now could see an old and powerful male leopard laying dead before him. Robbed of its mythos, the haggard man-eater now seemed much more typical and understandable to him. From just off the road shoulder, the shelter owner coughed gently to alert Corbett of his presence. The hunter motioned the owner down the slope to see the dead leopard. As he approached, he paused as its head came into view, and he cautiously asked Corbett if it was dead. After confirmation, he warily approached to Corbett's side and put his hands together and bowed down in an attempt to put his head on the hunter's feet, a show of deep gratitude. Four men suddenly appeared, descending the trail to the others. They had been so terrified after the shot that they left the oil lamp burning all night and still had it lit in the daytime. Soon thereafter, Ibbotson's guards arrived and were alarmed to see Corbett missing from the hunting blind and the goat still tethered below. They were worried the leopard had claimed the life of yet another victim as they observed the blood trail crossing the boulder. After the relief of finding him below, they rigged a bamboo pole and removed the now stiff leopard from the hole and carried it to the road. Corbett and Ibbotson's men began the journey back to the bungalow, with the leopard being carried along with them. They arrived at the bungalow and pounded on the door to wake up a still-sleeping Ibbotson. The men placed the leopard's carcass on the veranda, and Ibbotson happily danced around it in celebration and relief. He ordered water to be drawn for a bath for Corbett, and sent telegrams to the press and government offices to notify them that the terror had been brought to an end by a single bullet, fired from a distance of only ten yards on May 2, 1926. Corbett drank an entire pot of tea and happily soaked in the warm bath to relax after the success. After a while, the men began to assess the condition and health of the leopard. It measured seven feet six inches from its nose to the tip of its tail. Its fur had faded to a light straw color from advanced age and was short and brittle from the same. It had no whiskers either. Its teeth were worn down and discolored, and one of its canine teeth was broken off. It had a single bullet wound in its right shoulder from the bullet fired by Corbett, and its left rear pad had been creased by a bullet, creating its hallmark track. On the same paw it was missing a toe and a claw. Along its head it had several deep gashes which were partially healed, probably from the fight with the other male. On its rear right leg it had a partially healed deep gash from the fight as well. Its tail had numerous cuts and gashes along its length, which were in the same state of healing and probably from the same source. On its left rear leg, the leopard had a partially healed gash with a missing piece of skin complemented by the piece found at the trap from which it escaped previously. Interestingly, the mouth and tongue of the leopard were found to be black in color, possibly attributed to the cyanide poisoning. In its chest, they found a single pellet of buckshot fired at it by a villager just before the leopard began hunting humans. Villagers from all around the area began to gather near the bungalow to see the leopard and planned a reception at the Rudra Prayag Bazaar to celebrate the leopard's death. Attendees brought offerings of flowers and according to custom the person receiving the blessing would touch the offering with the right hand. Then the person presenting the offering cupped their hands together and poured out the petals on their feet in a sign of gratitude. 
This blessing process occurred several dozen times throughout the reception, and all around Corbett's feet lay hundreds of flower petals. The government tallied the death toll from the man-eating leopard of Rudra Prayag ended at 125 humans, but was actually much higher as many deaths were unreported. The numbers indicated that villages that took precautions had fewer deaths from the leopard. This leopard killed an average of 13 people each year for nine years. Thank you for watching Scary Animal Attacks. If you like this video, please consider hitting that like button and clicking on the bell icon to keep you notified of our latest video releases. Sharing our video links on your social media might help save a life and spread the fun. As a member of our human network, be careful out there because you don't want to end up on an episode of Scary Animal Attacks.